Now, if you would, I don't typically do this. A lot of uh, pastors do these things. I don't do this, but I'll do it today just for the fun of it. Turn to your neighbor and say, Maranatha. Now, do you know what you just said <laughs> to your neighbor? So for many, many, many years, and still today, it's, it's very much common even today, but particularly in the ancient Jewish tradition, when you greeted someone, you would say shalom. That was the Jewish greeting. That's what everyone said to each other. But at some point after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, there began to be a shift, particularly among the early church, among what they said, their greeting to one another. Instead of saying shalom, which means peace, they would say Maranatha. That's, that's what they would say to each other and say, what does that mean? Well, in the Hebrew, it simply means this. It, it means, O oh Lord, come. O oh Lord, come. Now, the Prince of Peace has already come. Now, he'll bring ultimate peace when he comes again, but he's already brought peace between us and God. We were enemies with God. We were at war with God, and he brought peace with us and God. And so in some ways, the Prince of Peace has already come. We can say shalom, peace, but we already have peace with God. And so now we say, O oh Lord, come. The, the uh, Arabic word for that simply means the Lord is coming. So both works uh, as far as our study goes. That's, that's what we're looking at as we're studying through this series on Jesus is coming. And what we're crying out is, Jesus, please come. O oh Lord, come. We are waiting eagerly awaiting your coming. Now, a lot of people are like, Jesus is coming back. I don't, I don't know what to look for. I don't know when it's going to be, but boy, there's a lot of messed up stuff going on in the world right now. Is it it? And so that's why we're studying this right now. We're taking a break from our study in Romans, and we're particularly anchoring ourselves in Matthew chapter 24, which is the Olivet Discourse. It's where Jesus gives his longest answer to any question ever asked him. And the question is, is when is your coming? Now, of course, they were thinking of his coming of the millennial kingdom, but in the discourse, he obviously goes much further than just that, and he explains a lot. Now, it's, it's talked about in Mark chapter 13, Matthew 24, and in Luke 24, and so I'm kind of taking bits and pieces of those texts and, and combining them together. Now, if you're guest here today, I apologize for the last two weeks, we've been stuck on verse number 15 of Matthew 24, which basically says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. And we just haven't been able to make it past that because we've been trying to understand. Because that's what he said, let the reader understand. And it's a very, very difficult thing to understand. You practically need to go back to the book of Daniel understand chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12. When you go there, go to Revelation 13, and when you're done there, go to 2 Thessalonians and maybe even tack in some passages in 1 Thessalonians and take some passages from other Old Testament prophets before you begin to even get a bird's eye view of what it means, the abominations uh, or the abomination of desolation. And so, We've kind of parked there for a little bit. Today, I have a lot to say, and I'm going to try to say it as quickly and as efficiently as I can. And so uh, if, if, you're, if you feel a little behind, that's okay. It is being recorded. You can go back and listen to previously recorded sermons. To date, we have covered the first 14 verses of Matthew 24, which basically Jesus gives to his disciples signs to look for preceding his coming. He talks about false Christs that will arise and wars and rumors of wars. He talks about famines and diseases, which that, that one right there seems to be the one a lot of people are like, this is it! This is it! The coronavirus is Jesus! And all, you know, there's, and, and I don't know, it, it may be, but we're looking at the signs. And, and personally, I believe that there are some things yet to, to be seen, and so we'll look at some of those as well. But he talks about earthquakes in different places. He talks about the persecution of the church, and that's, a, that's an important one there. He talks about lawlessness in the streets. He talks about mankind's love turning to hate. 
These are all signs preceding the coming of Christ. But when you get to Matthew 24 and verse number 15, this is the, this is the big sign. This is the one that the prophet Daniel focuses on. This is the one that many other Old Testament prophetic writers focused on. This is the one that Paul focuses on. This is the one that John on the Isle of Patmos is like, this is the big one. When you see this, when you see this event, this abomination of desolation, when you see this happen, then you know it's no longer close. You are there. It is happening. Go, hide in the mountains. Run. Don't go back into your house. Don't come off of the... I mean, just get away. If you're in Jerusalem, that is. If you're in Jerusalem, get away. When you hear this, when you see this happening, run for your life. It is now the beginning of the end. In fact, let me go ahead and if you're open to Matthew 24, I want to read those verses. He says, once again, in verse 15, therefore, always important to pay attention to the therefores in the Bible. So he has built up to these signs and these signs are leading up to this point. And when you therefore see this, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babes in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Now in order, as he said there in verse 15, let, the, let he who reads understand, in order to understand what that passage even means, we're going to have to go back to the book of Daniel. And we've already done a precursory study of the book of Daniel, a somewhat overview of some of it last week and, and the previous week. And I think you could probably, everyone's in agreement, the book of Daniel is a book of prophecy. It's a book of visions foretelling the future. And if I were to sum up the book of Daniel, I think the book of Daniel sums itself up in Daniel chapter 2 and verse number 28 when it says, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. In many ways, you could say that is what the entire premise of the book of Daniel is all about. There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. Now, what are some of these secrets? Well, in chapter number two, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, he has this dream. He doesn't understand what it means. And so Daniel, the Hebrew prophet, comes and by the power of God, gives him interpretation of that dream. That kind of sets the stage for the rest of the book. Because in that dream, it begins to unfold and unravel the mystery of the future in regards to the Gentile empires, the governmental structures that are to come and go. And in chapter number seven, he kind of gets another vision. And this time, it's the first of four visions that Daniel's going to receive. And this first vision is of four beasts. And obviously, at the end of the vision, Daniel feels really sick, and he's confused, and he doesn't understand, and he is given clarity as to what these four beasts represent. In chapter number eight, you have the second vision that's given to Daniel, and it's of a ram and of a goat, and the interpretation of that vision is given to him as well. In chapter nine, you have Daniel's third vision, and it is of the 70 weeks of prophecy, a very, very complicated a very detailed section of scripture. I thought about teaching through that, but then I'm, I'm like, I'm looking at my schedule and thinking it's going to probably take me weeks just to get through Daniel 9, but a very, very important passage. It's basically the timetable of prophecy. It really sets forth when things are going to happen and the, the schedule, you could say, the prophetic schedule of which things will happen. And then you have Daniel's fourth vision that God gives him, and this is a longer one. And it transpires over chapter 10, 11, and 12. So when you read the book of Daniel, when you get to chapter 10, realize this is one vision all the way to the very end of the book. And this fourth vision is a vision of the end times. Now, in the book of Daniel, 
That term that Jesus referred to, the abomination of desolation, it's mentioned three times. It's mentioned in Daniel 9, it's mentioned in Daniel 11, and it's mentioned in Daniel chapter number 12. For time's sake, we'll not look at Daniel 9. We may go back to it a little bit later in this series because eventually we're going to get into some other prophetic passages in the book of Revelation and 1 Corinthians or 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and 1st Corinthians and so forth. Who knows all where we'll go, but I know this. I know along the journey we'll be forced to go back to the book of Daniel uh, from time to time. And so I'm going to table that one for this week, and I'm going to focus on that last vision, Daniel's fourth and last um, vision, to kind of set up the context of this vision that he receives in chapter 10. It takes place in the year 5. 36 BC. And we know that because it says so. It doesn't give the date, but it talks about who was in charge in the first year of his reign. And so we know exactly what year that is represented. It's 536 BC, which means that Daniel himself is an old man. He's roughly around 83 to 85 years old at this time. And this vision takes place just shortly after uh, Daniel has as you are very familiar with, I'm sure, the story of him being cast into the lion's den. So when you think of Daniel in the lion's den, think of an old man, an old man that's thrown in there. And shortly after that time of being in the lion's den, he is given this vision. And he's also given interpretation to this vision by Gabriel. And there's another special helper in uh, Daniel's uh, last vision, which I, I particularly believe is, is a, a reincarnate. Jesus in this passage. Now, two years after Gabriel talked with Daniel in the previous vision is when he is approached again about this final vision. And this vision takes place um, just probably within months, maybe even less, uh, of the time that the first wave of the Jewish people are returning back to the land. If you remember, for 70 years, the Jewish people are in captivity in Babylon, and uh, I won't go into all the details about why they are now able to go back home, but there's a change of new management, and they are given permission to head back home. And so they are going back home. They're going to rebuild the walls. They're going to rebuild the temple. And Daniel's been reading the book of Jeremiah, and he's understanding that uh, the time is near and these things are happening, but I'm still crazy confused because these visions that I keep getting keep talking about more desolation. It keeps talking about more suffering. It keeps talking about more captivity. It keeps talking about more destruction. And I don't get it because I've read Jeremiah the prophet and we're at the end. And I'm living in the days when our people are actually going back home. I see it happening. They're going back. How can, how can these visions possibly be true that there's more destruction to come? I, I see that this, this looks like this is the glory days. And if, you, if you've ever read Nehemiah and Ezra, you, you could probably say that those are probably some of the best years in all the history of the Jewish people. Years of revival, years of them reestablishing and following the rules of God and passionately pursuing God with all their mind, heart, and soul. Those are great years. And Daniel's probably thinking, I, I don't, I'm, I'm bothered by this idea that I'm being told that there are worse days that lie ahead. So that is a foundation. Let's look at chapters, if you haven't turned there already, Daniel chapter number 10. And we'll look at kind of, uh, we'll kind of skim through some sections here as we make our way towards the end of the book. Let me give you, um, particularly in chapter number 11, because the, the first part of Daniel 10 deals a little bit about Daniel and setting up the scene for this vision that he's going to receive. And then you get into chapter 11 where you really have the vision that's being given to him. The first part of that vision deals with historic events that have already transpired. I'm not going to get into that because I've talked a little bit about that already. And I, you can find plenty of material out there to find out more. I'm really struggling on not to say something about that. And, and the reason why is because this series is about Christ coming again. It's not about going back and looking at historic events and trying to figure out when they happened. And so I have to restrain myself. And, and as we go through the book of Daniel, say, okay, which parts are looking to the future? Which parts are actually in reference to what Jesus is referring to. 
And for that, it really begins, I believe, in Daniel chapter 11 and verse number 21. Some Bible scholars would push it off onto verse number 36, but I believe it goes back to verse number 21. And what you see here in verses 21 through 31 is what happens before the tribulation time. In verses 31 through 45, you see what happens in the tribulation time. And in, verse, in chapter 12 and verses 1 through 13, you see what is happening after the tribulation time. And so before the tribulation, in the tribulation, after the tribulation. Yes, there are references to historic events in these chapters. Uh, I'm not going to uh, deny that one bit, but I, I think Antiochus Epiphanes IV is um, basically a precursor of these future events. And, and, the, and let me just lay the foundation. One of the reasons I say that Daniel chapter 11, particularly verse 21, all the way to the end of the book, is all referencing the future. These are, these are not events of the past. I believe every word of it is for the future. And the reason I believe that is because of the grammar of the text, particularly when you get into chapter number 12. In chapter number 12, he uses three times uh, at that time, when that happens, at that time. The, the, these are statements referring to the vision that he's just been talking about. These are undeniable connections that go all the way back to verse number 21. So Daniel is writing a prophecy that says, at that time, and we'll get into that in a few moments, these things will happen. And so that time has not come yet. So what we're going to be looking at in this passage is things yet to come, yet to come. Now, Daniel chapter 11 and verses 36 through 45 are really, really interesting verses because those, you, you could say it's a standalone passage. No, th these, this is a, these are details about the, uh, the rule of the Antichrist that you'll not find anywhere else in Scripture, no Old Testament passages or New Testament passages. So this is kind of like uh, um, exclusive, exclusive news, exclusive prophecy to Daniel himself. So really, really a great passage of Scripture. Okay, are you there at Daniel chapter 10? Let's begin at verse number 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel whose name was called Belteshazzar. That, that's Daniel's Babylonian name. The message was true, but the appointed time was long. So at the very beginning of this vision, it's announced, it's announced that these things are a long way away. They're not going to happen very close. They're not, they're not near. The, the, these are vision. This is a vision that is a long appointed time away. And he understood the message and he understood uh, and the understanding of the vision. Now go to verse number 14. Like I said, I'm gonna skim through a lot of this. In verse number 14, it says, now I, and the I there, uh, I believe is the pre-incarnate Jesus. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people, that's the Jewish people, in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. So for the Jewish people, and as we get into chapter number 12, I think we can be included in that. But for the Jewish people, these are events that will transpire many, many days into the future. So Daniel is being told things that are not going to happen in his lifetime. And, and he is told that in chapter number 12. He said, just uh, seal it up and Go about and live your life because uh, none of this, you, you won't experience any of this, is what he's told. He's just simply writing it. And by the way, he doesn't even know what he's, he doesn't understand any of this. At the end of chapter number 12, he asks, he's like, what does this mean? The guy's like, it doesn't matter. You're not going to be alive. This is for, this is for other people. This is for us and those who will come behind us. Daniel is just the writer. He's the penman. He's a, uh, is as Peter talks about later on for that, that no prophecy came by private interpretation, but holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit. So when Daniel was moved by the Holy Spirit to pin down the, the vision, it wasn't of his own private interpretation. He didn't know what he was writing. He didn't know what it was about. He didn't understand what these things were pointing to, and it wasn't for him. It was for us. 
much, much later that would come along. His job was simply to record it so that we could uh, read it later on. And the same is true in many ways for the, um, the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos. He's, he's writing down all these things, which we call the book of Revelation. He's writing down all these things, and half of it, he just doesn't understand. It's like, I don't, I don't really understand these things. And it's almost as God's like, it's okay, John. You don't have to understand. It's not for you. I'm, I'm using you to get truth to another generation to come. Well, in chapter 11, let's move there. I need to move along because, like I said, it's been, uh, I got a lot to cover. So chapter 11, verse number 1 through 20, you have the near future fulfillments of world leaders. And these world leaders, as talked about in chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, and at the beginning of chapter 11, these world leaders, Empires include the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greece Empire, the Roman Empire, and then the last one, which is the fierce one, the one that the Antichrist himself will rule. Uh, many scholars, if not most, believe this is a revised, uh, a revived Roman Empire. There are some that believe that this is possibly a revived Ottoman Empire. Um, I'm not dogmatic either way. Um, there are good, really good, biblical, solid arguments on both sides of the fence there. So I don't know whether it be Roman or Ottoman. I do know this. It will be led by the Antichrist, and it will be global, and it will be wealthy, and it will bring about peace like we have never seen, particularly for the Jewish people. And after three and a half years, all that goes bye-bye. In chapter 11 and verse number 21, it says, and in his place shall arise a vile person. Now, I think historically this could certainly be referring to Antiochus Epiphanes. I think all of what transpires aligns perfectly historically with that. But I also believe that he was a figure of the Antichrist to come. And once again, as we get into chapter 12, I think you'll see that because the grammar forces you this is one area where I'm not going to be dogmatic on a lot of areas, but I think I have to be dogmatic on this area because the grammar of the text forces us uh, to be dogmatic. He says that there will arise a vile person. It's not your boss or your neighbor. It's a, this will be a much, much more vile person. Some of you have great bosses and neighbors, so I'm just joking. But this will be the most vile person the world has ever known. Now, initially, he won't be known as that. Initially, he'll be loved, he'll bring about peace and prosperity, and he'll be this um, charismatic political leader that has all the answers, and he just seems like, man, where has this guy been? We really need him to not just be the leader of a regional section of the world, he needs to be the leader of all the world, and so all the reins are given over to him. Now, the Bible calls him many things uh, throughout Scripture. In this passage, I believe he is called the vile person. In Genesis 3, he is called the seed of Satan. In Daniel 7, he's called the little horn. In Daniel 8, he is called the king of fierce countenance. In Daniel 9, he is referred to as the prince that shall come. Also in Daniel 9, he is called the desolator. In Daniel 11, he is called the despicable person. And also, he's called the willful king. In Matthew 24, 15, we've already looked at this, obviously. He's, he is the abomination of desolation. In 2 Thessalonians 2, he is the man of sin. He's also referred to as the son of perdition. He's also referred to in that passage as the lawless one. And in 1 John chapter 2, he is called the Antichrist. And that's the one that we typically associate with him. But in the book of Revelation, if you read the final book of the Bible, he is referred to particularly by one name, and that is, he is the beast. And honestly, I can't think of a better name for the Antichrist than that. He is simply just a beast. He is a ruthless, evil dictator who will come in and lie to the world. And he'll offer the world everything they could conceivably want to have, peace and prosperity. Yeah, but in a short period of time, everything will be turned upside down because of him. We'll look at uh, chapter 11 and verse number 40, and we'll pick up there. Verse number 40 says, at that time of the end. Now, once again, contextually, we are still talking about this vile person. 
So once again, the grammar says, at that time, this, while this vile person is in charge, while this vile person is causing havoc onto the world, it says, at that time of the end, so that sets the time frame. It's, it's, not, it's not the near future. It's not Antiochus Epiphanes. This is sometime near the end of time. That the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen, many ships, and he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. He shall also enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overwhelmed, but these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. I'm not going to get into the details about what those peoples are today. Obviously, those names have changed hands from time to time, as there's been um, battles that have occurred over the centuries. It says in verse number 42, he shall stretch out his hand against the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall follow at his heels, but the news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Troubles me too. Therefore, he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. And he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas of the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end, and no one will help him. In another passage in uh, Daniel, he says that he will come to destruction without the assistance of man. And so in other words, it's not going to be another army that destroys him. It's not going to be any person or political figure that destroys him. He will come to his end and no one will help him. God will bring him to an end, and specifically Jesus, with a word, in fact, will bring him to an end. Okay, so that, that's the Antichrist. I'm not going to dive into that passage that much. That's kind of the rise of the Antichrist and a very quick, as you get into verse number 25, or 45 rather, a very quick crashing, he's going to end and no one's going to help him. He's going to be, he's going to be done. That sets us up for going into chapter number 12. And chapter number 12 is the third and final time that Daniel references the abomination of desolation. This is the one that Jesus is referring to. Jesus was not referring to a historic event of the past. Jesus was referring to an event yet to come in the future. And so this is the one that Jesus is talking about. Daniel chapter 12, verse number 1. At that time. What time? Well, verse number 45 says, Yet he shall come to an end. At the time that the Antichrist comes to an end. Well, who is this anti? Who is this person who's coming to the end? Well, verse 21 of chapter 11 says, in his place shall arise a vile person. So this vile person is going to arise to power and he's going to gain uh, authoritative and uh, he's going to gain uh, geo-economic uh, power. He's, he's going to gain global authority. He's going to bring about peace and prosperity. And then he's going to be a turncoat, and he's going to bring about destruction and persecution on particularly the Jewish people until he can't find them because God protects them. And then he turns his anger towards the saints of God, none of which is mentioned in chapter 11. Let me tell you why. Daniel is written for the Jewish people. It's not written for the church. So God is not giving visions of the church. He'll do that through John, the apostle, in the book of Revelation. He'll, he'll unfold what the church looks like in these end times. But Daniel's focus is on what Israel looks like in these end times. And so he skips all of that. But who is this person? He says, at that time, the time that the Antichrist is brought to an end, Michael shall stand up, he goes on to say. Now pay attention to Michael. Now in the book of Daniel, we've been hearing about Gabriel. These are two powerful angels of Jesus. And Gabriel is the messenger angel. He's the one who comes and brings clarity and understanding and message. But Michael is an archangel. And as far as we know, there's only one archangel. That's him, Michael. And that's important that you understand that because Michael plays a very, very important role 
in prophetic future events. You'll see Michael in Revelation chapter number 12. You'll see Michael represented in 2 Thessalonians. You'll see Michael represented multiple times when it comes to the book of Revelation because Michael is the warrior angel. He is the one who is bringing about protection for the nation of Israel and for the church. And so Michael stands up at that time, at the time of the destruction of the Antichrist, Michael stands up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. So he is given charge to watch over the nation of Israel. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. So that sounds exactly like what Jesus was referring to in Matthew 24 and verse number 21, when he said, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world. So when Jesus said that in Matthew 24, and he said, Let the reader understand, he was pointing you, the reader, back to Daniel chapter number 12, and says, That's when that's going to happen. When the Antichrist is destroyed, when he is abolished off of this earth, and my kingdom is going to be established at that time. Uh, well, basically at this time, this is, this is when the Antichrist breaks his covenant with the nation of Israel and he, he launches persecution against them. But all of that is culminating at what time? It's the time that you see the abomination of desolation practiced in the temple of God. Continue reading, verse number one. At the end of it, he says, at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Now let me point out once again the, the grammar of the text. Verse number one, he says, at that time. At the end of verse number one, he says, at that time your people shall be delivered. Now a lot of people, preterists, I'm, I'm not going to get into a lot of theological terms, but there are, are groups of people called preterists, and they believe that everything you read in the book of Daniel has already happened in the past. It either happened in the 160s BC or it happened in 70 AD with General Titus. They believe that all of those things have already been fulfilled. However, there is a big, big problem here. When you believe that and you read Daniel chapter 12, it says, at that time, your people will be delivered. That didn't happen in the 160s BC. And it certainly didn't happen in 70 AD. And there are no time in history when the children of Israel have been delivered and saved by their enemies fully and completely. At no point have they come to full relationship with their Messiah. They are still rejecting Jesus as their Messiah, and they are still living under the bondage of the Gentile world that they are in. This is why in Luke chapter number 21, he refers to this as the times of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles means this, the time when the Gentile worlds have their global empires, they have control over the world. I can guarantee you right now, uh, Israel does not have global power. They're struggling to stay in existence right now. <laughs> they're, they're, they're struggling to maintain a name and a land and a place for them. They're struggling to even have a place to worship. So they haven't been delivered, not even yet. That is a time to come in the future. He goes on to say in verse number two, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now this is speaking of the resurrection. So when he says at that time, that time obviously has not happened. I mean, the resurrection is final. The resurrection is the end. This is not something of the past. We are awaiting the resurrection to come. And there's only one resurrection. I know there's uh, those that believe there's like two or three. Some even believe four resurrections to come. That's, that's just not in Scripture. There is one resurrection, and we're awaiting that time to come. And so he says... Those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So what God tells Daniel is, you need to, these things that you're writing down, 
You need to seal it up, write it down, preserve it, make copies of it, make sure that the preceding generations are able to read it and understand it. But this is not for you. This is not for your generation. In fact, this is not even for the preceding generations after you. This is for the generation of the end time. And what I mean by that is this. At the end of Matthew 24, Jesus makes it very clear. He says, that generation will not pass away until they see all these things fulfilled. Now, what does he mean by that? What he means is, those who are living in that generation, when they see the abomination of desolation, they know that they are in the very end, and all of these things that we're reading about, every single one of them will be fulfilled in their generation, in their time. And so God tells Daniel, seal it up, pack it up, get it prepared, get it ready. It's a gift for future generations to read, and they'll understand it. They'll know what it means, and it will, it will bring about revel revelation for them to know how to cope with these end days. He goes on to say in verse number five, then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on this riverbank and the other on that riverbank. And one, whom is presumably an angel, said to the man clothed in linen, who is presumably Jesus, going back to the beginning of chapter 11, who was above the waters of the river, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? So the angel asked the question, the angel asked Jesus, pre-incarnate Jesus, he asked him, how long is it going to be before these wonders happen? Now, what wonders are we referring to? What, what wonders is he asking? Well, since the vision began, you have the rise of the Antichrist in 11 and verse 21. You have the abomination of desolation talked about in 11 verse number 31. You have the Antichrist coming to his end in chapter 11 and verse number 45. You have the deliverance of Israel talked about in chapter 12 and verse number one. And you have the resurrection of the dead talked about in chapter 12 verses two and three. That, that is the wonders that he's asking about. When are those wonders going to take place? When are those things going to happen? This is, and you got you to remember, here's, this is Daniel who is listening to this. Daniel's already been told, your people are going to go back into your land. You're going to reestablish the worship. You're going to reestablish, build the walls. You're going to reestablish the temple worship. And Daniel's like, okay, I am really confused because now you're telling me that there's going to be yet more devastation to come. When are these things going to happen? If this is what you're telling me is going to happen now, when is that stuff going to happen? Well, the answer is found in verse number seven of chapter 12. Then I heard the man clothed in linen, which I believe is Jesus, who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. That's Daniel's unique way of, or really Jesus's unique way of saying three and a half years. Anytime you see that term times, time, times, and half a time, that's always referring to three and a half years. And when the power, he goes on to say, and when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. So the answer is twofold. When, when are these events in the future going to take place? The answer is number one, uh, after three and a half years. When you see the abomination of desolation mentioned in verse number 31, that's the beginning. After three and a half years, that's when these things will happen. Answer number two is this, the shattering of the holy people. That's what he says at the end of verse number seven. Him who lives forever, that it shall be for a time, a times, and half a time. So after three and a half years, persecution will begin, and persecution will bring about the shattering of the holy people. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time in the book of Daniel, but if you would, a uh, book of Revelation, but go to Revelation chapter 13 real quick. Revelation chapter 13, verse number five. You, in, in the chapter of Revelation 13, you see the rise of the Antichrist. And you'll see also the fall of the Antichrist not long after that. But you see the rise of the Antichrist in Revelation chapter number 13. And you see what havoc and pain he brings onto the 
the holy people of God. Revelation 13, verse number five, he says, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue 42 months. That's three and a half years. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war, not with God or with Michael and his angels. It was granted from heaven to him, the Antichrist, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. This is called the wrath of Satan, the wrath of the Antichrist. When he will unleash, as Jesus will say in Matthew 24, and as Daniel said here in this text that we're studying, that there will be persecution on the earth, the likes of which we have never seen before. Now that persecution will continue to go. The amount of time, I'm not certain. The Bible doesn't give us a specific time on how long it lasts. But the persecution will last until, one, until a certain point. And what is that point? The persecution will last until he says, the holy people have been completely shattered. So what does that mean? That means that the persecution of God's people will be so severe, not like Hitler's Holocaust, not like General Titus's destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, not like, not like anyone else you've ever seen in the past, and the, and the Jewish people have seen a lot, and the church has seen a lot. There will be suffering for the holy people of God like you have never seen before. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, had he not shortened those days, none of them would have survived. But it is for the elect's sake, it's for his love for the church and his preservation for Israel that he shortens the days of Satan's wrath so that there will be survivors. And so when he says at the, at the three and a half mark, there will begin this time of persecution and suffering. I'm going to go back to Daniel chapter 12 now, in verse number eight. Daniel says, although I heard, I did not understand I feel you, Daniel. I hear and read a lot of things in the Bible and I still don't understand. I'm like, help me out, Lord. He said, then, then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? It's almost like it, it, the, the expression is this. Oh, my Lord, what does this mean? What is the end of this? What is the end of my people? What is the end of Israel? Does this mean that we're going to be totally annihilated? Verse number nine, and he said, this is Jesus, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Basically, what he says is, it's not your problem. I'm in control. You don't need to know, Daniel. All you need to do is write down what I tell you to write down. These are for, the, this is for the end. And those who read it and study it and understand it in the end, those are the ones who will be strengthened and helped and encouraged and empowered by it. Verse number 10, very quickly here, I need to close it up. Many shall be purified, made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. I hope that you're in that group of the wise this morning, that you'll not just shove off the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation and say, you know, it's just too complicated. It's too rough. It's too hard to understand. I don't know what it means. I'm just going to trust that everything will work out. It'll all come out in the wash. It'll be all right. And that's true. Some of that's true. But the wise are going to be eagerly awaiting Christ and they're going to be eagerly looking for the signs of Christ. And they're going to be eagerly studying and passionately studying the words of God so that they'll know what to look for. That, that is those who are wise. In fact, the latter half of Matthew 24 is all about how wise it is to be looking for the signs. And so Daniel says there'll be those who will understand in those days and they will be wise. Verse number 11, and from the time 
that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the, des- and the abomination of desolation is set up. There it is. That's the last and final time it's talked about. From the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. That's three and a half years. Very briefly here, what is he talking about? The Antichrist will make a treaty with 10 nations. He will become the sovereign leader of it. And in that treaty, he will orchestrate peace with the the people of Israel. He will allow them to begin their sacrificial worship again, which they're ready to do at this day. They've been ready for actually years. And they've, it's any moment they could go. I mean, they've got the high priest, they've got the red heifer, they've, they've got everything they need. They've been practicing, they've been orchestrating, they've, they've, they've been planning this whole thing out. They're just waiting for the day that they can have a temple to go in and do it and the freedom to do so. And so that day will come when the Antichrist says, I'm going to make a peace with everyone, let the Jewish people practice their worship, let them do their sacrifices, and for three and a half years, there will be peace with Israel, they will worship and sacrifice, and there will be prosperity in the world, and at, after three and a half years, the Antichrist will change his mind. The Bible says in Daniel that he changed his mind because of the wealth. On his journey home from a faraway land, he thinks about the wealth. His God is really money, it seems, and fortresses. He thinks about the wealth, and he changes his mind. And when he changes his mind, he then unleashes persecution onto the children of God. He sets up an idol within the temple. He causes everyone to worship him as God. All of that's going to transpire near the end. Well, let's wrap up this book called Daniel. Verse number 12. Blessed is he who waits. That's all of us right now. That's what John says as well in the book of Revelation. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. Now, that's that's 45 extra days after the three and a half years. Now, what does that mean? I'll tell you exactly what that means. I don't have a clue. I have no idea. And anybody that says they do, they're, they're lying. They don't know what that means either. There's some good speculations out there, but we don't know what that means. There, there's another 30-day um, discrepancy in, in this passage as well. The Bible just doesn't tell us. But it, what it does tell us is in those days, those who wait 45 days more, there's a blessing for them. There's a blessing for those in that time. And in verse number 13, he says, but you, you go your way till the end For you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. So what he's telling him is, you'll be one of those who was resurrected in that day. You'll be one of those who was resurrected to eternal life. You just write these words down. You go about your life. And when it happens, it happens. So I want to close with this verse. This is Hebrews 9 and verse number 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. We have a we have a somewhat of an understanding of what Daniel is pointing to in the future. We're trying to grapple with what Jesus is saying in Matthew 24. We're desperately searching and eagerly trying to understand what the book of Revelation is teaching us about the coming of Christ. But this much we do know. That for us who eagerly wait and eagerly search for the signs of his coming, we are the ones who are going to be the most blessed. We're going to be caught off guard. We're not going to be, oh, no, I wasn't ready. I, I wasn't living right. I, you know, I don't know what the, and it's not that you have to uh, depend on living right and your good works. He says he is coming to bring about the salvation he has already given you. If you've put your trust in Christ, if you've repented of your sins, if you've given yourself to him as your Lord and master of your life, he is already, you are already saved and he is already your master. He is already your king and he is most assuredly coming again to receive you into his kingdom, as he says in the book of John. And so there's a blessing. There's a blessing. So I hope that, I know this is a very, very complex piece of passage. 
Uh, but I hope this morning that there's a little bit more clarity uh, to the things that you are reading, a little bit more clarity to understanding the prophetic timeline of future events to come. And I think as we continue to go through Matthew 24 and 25, and as we look at other passages, uh, you'll begin to see the pieces of the puzzle coming together, and you'll be able to see the bigger picture of these things. Bottom line is this, Maranatha. If you're worried about what's going to transpire here in America in the next few months, in the next few years, if you're anxious about the unsettling news that we're constantly hearing about the, the political unrest and the civil unrest going on in our streets, I've got good news for you. Maranatha. If you're worried about what the future of your health and wealth, and if you're worried about what, what's going to happen with you, and when is Christ going to come, and how, is it going to be suffering, and, and, I, and, I, and I, I fear the future, and I don't want to look to the future, and I, I've got good news for you this morning. Maranatha. He's coming. He's coming. And when he comes, all things will be made right. When he comes, all evil will be removed. When he comes, there will be not a three and a half year fake peace and prosperity. There will be an eternal peace and prosperity because the Antichrist is a liar. He is a fake. He is a fraud. There is only one Prince of Peace, and his name is Jesus Christ, and he is coming again. Amen. And for all those who put their trust in the Lordship of Christ and await his coming, you will join him in that millennial kingdom.